Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the State of the Web. My guest is Colin Bendel. He's part of the CTO office at Cloudinary and co-author of the book, High Performance Images. And today, we're talking about the state of images. Let's get started. Colin, thank you for being here. I want to start by just talking about some of the things that developers have probably already heard about with image optimization. Let's start with layout stability. What are some of the things developers could do to eliminate that jankiness of image loading? Yeah, so I mean that's one of the one of the, the many challenges we have with images and video on the web, right? Is that experience where the user is engaging this in the page and all of a sudden they go to click on a link or scroll and all of a sudden everything moves and it's it's gone. And, and we talk about jank all, a lot of times because it's about JavaScript, you know, filling that uh, that buffer the, in the time loop and be able to do too much, and you can't do that. And but images also play uh, in that because if you have the browser has enough information, it's downloaded the CSS and and most of the JavaScript it needs, and it's doing the layout. But then it's images are a low priority request, and so they they come in later. And as they're coming in, if the browser didn't already have a box predefined then when the image finally comes in, it realizes, oh, this is a six by nine image, and then has to reflow everything, and you've got the re-layout. And so there's a number of strategies that uh, we've used in the web, uh, because ultimately we're trying to stop the user from having a poor experience, right? Uh, and we don't want to distract the user from the, that experience. So we've used in the past things like defining the height and width of an image, uh, which is great in a fixed layout kind of style. Uh, and, and this becomes one of those many different uh, strategies of, well, it kind of worked in the past, but now that I'm using max width and min width, I'm using respons uh, responsive uh, layouts, now how do I also define that height? Because if I can't define the height in absolute terms, we still have the same problem. So some of the more advanced uh, strategies now are using uh, techniques like low quality placeholders where you have a an image that maybe is encoded in base64 so it's like a, a very small image or maybe even an SVG that gives enough information to the browser early while it's doing layout to be able to already define what the height and width uh, of that element is uh, these are all challenges with the browser and there's uh, later on we can talk about uh, some of the new enhancements like intrinsic sizes and aspect ratio which are also trying to provide us new techniques to give that layout piece. Um, but ultimately, you know, there's the, the biggest boom for your ba uh, bang for your buck is to, to make sure you have defined those uh, widths and you know, low quality place is a good way to, to start with that. And if we can you know, start to transition to intrinsic sizes and things like that. Another age-old battle developers have been fighting with images has been the balance between quality and file size. And yeah. the image format has been one way of ensuring that you minimize the file size. So what is the conventional wisdom for using the right file format? Almost every day there's a new file format uh, that somebody's talking about. And we've got a lot of great standby formats, JPEG, PNG, GIF. I mean, if you've been on the web and you search around for image optimizations, you probably have seen a lot of these talks talking about these standard formats. And even some new formats, uh, like WebP or, or FLIF or other uh, standards out there. Now the, the challenge is that each of these formats have a different lineage, a different history. JPEG's been around for 25 years, 26 years. Uh, and it's a, a great format because it, it does a lot of great things to reduce the, uh, the, the bytes per pixel um, and give you a, a really nice small image. But it's designed for photographic need. So inside of that photographic, you ha are expecting to have gradients of colors that sunset picture or you know the the clothing the and that's not always the case of, that you're using so you have different formats that actually excel in different ways so you have uh, gifs and pngs which are great for probably more illustrations or you know where you're dealing with palettes or solid colors in, in large swaths so that way you can in the optimization of that of that format, that it's looking for those patterns and basically reducing the, the bytes down, and so then uh, you've got a smaller image that way, and that's what PNG. But because of the where they find those patterns varies dramatically between these different formats, uh, and so it really starts to come down first off by the use cases. You know, what are you trying to do? What kind of content are you do, trying to create? Icons, illustrations? Are you trying to do 
uh, photographic? Are you taking pictures of for a news event or uh, you know, for dinner and the picture of your of your plate? Uh, so the, each format has strengths and weaknesses to how you address it. And then you also can talk about formats like SVGs, which are great for vector uh, vector based imagery that can scale. Uh, based on the display area, where they don't have an exact pixel that needs to be stretched or, or shrunk. So those are the formats we have. Uh, but uh, the challenge always comes down to what does the end user support? You know, the, the browser or the app that they're consuming this content. Uh, fortunately, you know, here we are in 2019, JPEG, GIF, PNG, supported everywhere. They've been around for a long time, and these libraries are very old, they're very robust. But uh, so when we lock, talk about new formats, that's the first hurdle is like, how do we make sure that they can be supported? And then how do they compare in performance wise, uh, both in decode, but also bytes, savings? Um, yeah, and so there's a, you know, the, the standbys uh, are always the first place to start. And some of the features that you may want out of your images, like transparency, just aren't even supported in some formats. Oh, exactly, right? So, uh, JPEG is great for a photographic, but it doesn't do transparency. Uh, whereas GIFs can do transparency, uh, but single bit, whereas you can do with much uh, large, better transparency with PNGs. So you can do that, uh, that anti-aliasing with PNGs. So then you're also trapped with these trade-offs of what am I trying to accomplish and what uh, with the best format to get the byte savings down. It's good to note that, you know, the this paradigm that we're evolving into, you know, we're in this Instagram age, right? We've got lots of uh, images everywhere to, to grab our attention. And, you know, the, it almost s seems like images are an old thing. We should have solved this a long time ago, but yet it's a new thing, right? Uh, we have uh, this tension because we have content creators who are trying to create beautiful experiences. And then uh, us developers who are trying to, like, get a good, a uh, good score on Lighthouse and get our page performance down and, and uh, we have to balance these two objectives uh, in this, you know, with just the format selection. Exactly. Yeah. So once you've chosen a format, what are some of the knobs that you can fine tune to optimize image quality? Yeah, okay, so the, the, the standard ones that you'll probably see a lot on the web for JPEG, quality index, right? So you, you change the quality factor and you'll probably hear use quality 80 uh, as a good, now, it's a, probably a good spot to talk about, uh, when we say quality, we're not talking about percentages. A lot of people talk, think, you know, quality of 80% on JPEG. Uh, well, it's actually, it's a, a unit base of 100, and each of those 100 map to a quantization matrix. You know, it's a, uh, it's a matrix, an 8 by 8 matrix that's applied in JPEG world uh, to this image to try to reduce the number of colors, if you will, in this block. So if we can make those all more whites, the same kind of white, then we can easily compress that, those series of pixels out and we can get better savings. And the more aggressive that we can take the range of colors down. So quality index is, in JPEG is the one most people talk about, right? You start with quality 80, quality 90, you get a lot of bang for your buck on average. Uh, now, there's other strategies, and we could talk about uh, other ones like using chroma subsampling, which is a, a strategy where that comes from the TV industry, where you can take, separate the colors, you know, because your eye sees you've got cones and rods, and you are more sensitive to brightness than you are about the color itself. So, in say JPEG, you can not talk, you can express the bitstream of color in instead of just RGB, you can do it in in uh, y YCBCR. And that's the chroma, which is the color, and luminance uh, is the black and white or the, the brightness. And so your chroma subsampling is a technique where you, uh, you basically keep the, the, great, the luminance channel and the chroma, you can share the color and you know, say a two by two grid, share the, the same colors, uh, put one pixel of color and, though, and blending that with the the black and white or the, the luminance channel, you get this, uh, it perceives like different colors, but they're actually the same. This, this is how all TV uh, generally works. This is how we, we got color TVs back in the 20s, is by doing this trickery, playing with our eyes. And uh, so JPEG can support that. PNGs, GIFs, not so much. Um, another one is, is, uh, is progressive displays. 
So how you progressively uh, provide that content. Uh, so if you do uh, one quarter of the image and then uh, one half and then you know, full general terms, those scan layers as they apply, uh, they bring in the resolution of the, color of the image. And by doing that, you're actually able to save some bytes in, that, in those uh, layers in the JPEG world. So if you were to start from somewhere, I would say start with these three levers. Quality, probably 80 or 90. Uh, use chroma subsampling. Uh, again, we'll help, there's footnotes there. Uh, and and uh, you know, enable progressive uh, on those images. So we should also talk about mobile and how not only are the screen sizes getting smaller, but also the data plans are getting more expensive. So in what role have images played in adapting to the mobile world? I've been doing a lot of research uh, on my own about the consumption habits by users and looking at how they, uh, you know, how, how do different users in different environments consume the web, what kind of formats are available, and how is that in different experiences. And I always had this mental model of mobile and desktop. Right, and, and that there is these two paradigms. So these, I, and if I track it by time of day, I expected to see like desktop traffic, traffic go up in the morning, people go to work, and then it to peter off in the, even, uh, the afternoon, evening, as they go home, and then mobile traffic kind of carries on. Uh, it turns out that I was completely wrong. Uh, that in today's day and age, what we see is yes, the morning, eight, nine o'clock, you see traffic of desktop, but mobile's always there. And then in the afternoon, you have this decline, um, you know, five o'clock, slight, slight decline, but it continues on all the way. And mobile continues on and bumps up. So the first distinction I wanted to make is that uh, there really isn't a, a mobile versus desktop world. Desktop is there, is not just a gray box at our desk anymore. A, de a mobile device uh, includes our laptops which we classify as desktop, but is really, we carry that around on the subway and we do work. So uh, the, the minor correction I want to make is that, yeah, desktop is actually a mobile device. So to your question, the real question you asked about is what should we do for mobile strategies? Well, the first place we start is, of course, we should be dealing with responsive uh, layouts, right? Using flexible grids and, and all the, the great stuff to, to give that consistent experience regardless of your form factor, whether you're viewing it on a tablet or a phone or, or a desktop. Uh, but this has a number of other challenges because you now have a very wide screen or very narrow portrait and landscape uh, challenges. So where do I start? Uh, so the good news is that we've got, uh, you know, for a number of years here, we've had support for uh, responsive images. So you can use source set and source. Uh, these two attributes on the image tag uh, with source set allow you to specify to the browser, hey, I have a number of different versions of the same image that allow me to define different breakpoints. So uh, if you have a, a wide image and you want to say on a giant screen uh, versus a smaller screen, it's the same image, but I've got you know, different pixel volume. So source set allows you to say, hey, I've got a 200 pixel wide version, a 300, a 500, a 1,000 pixel, et cetera. But it's the same image just being you know, resized. The other side, the other attribute we have, or it's not an attribute, it's an element, is the source element. So in the picture tag, you can now have a source that says, I have not just one image here, but I have actually different cuts of that image. So I have the image that is, um, square, perhaps, in this layout, but maybe I've got a wider version as well, if I've got a desktop uh, view. So what can I do with that? Uh, so you, you want to specify your media queries and then you know, provide that different context so you can have that very fluid experience of the same image, but instead of just resizing and making it squishy and small, but you get now a, uh, maybe different cuts uh, from you know, portrait to square to letterbox, whatever based on the experience of the, of the web. You make a good point about you can never really be sure is a desktop device purely the gray box sitting at home. But like if I use, for example, I use my mobile phone at home on my home Wi-Fi where you know, the network isn't really affecting me. So you can't really make too many assumptions about like, well, I need to serve low quality images. They're on a small form factor device. It's not always true. 
So do client hints help at all here to understand the context of the user's experience? Yeah, yeah. So client hints is a strategy that allows the browser to send additional information along the wire to the content servers. And now this is at the HTTP layer. So you enable it through markup or through HTTP headers saying, you know, enable the uh, client hints. Uh, and the different client hints that are available today are with, viewport with, and DPR. So DPR is, sorry, start with with. Uh, with is the relative to the viewport. Uh, the viewport is the screen. With is the how wide is this specific image. Uh, so as I said, viewport with is the actual screen size. And then DPR uh, is that uh, the density of the pixels, uh, you have a 2x or 3x. These hints, when they're sent across the wire in the content negotiation, allow the content server to say, oh, I see you're making a request for this image. I see that your layout is you know, 500 pixels wide for this image. Uh, I will send you an image that is appropriately sized. Uh, the objective here is that it helps save you with your markup so you don't have to have you know, all the verbose markup that says, hey, here's all of the different source sets and all the different uh, source attribute uh, elements. You can now simplify that down and let the content negotiation uh, define you know, what should I send to that, uh, that client. Now, there's a, I'll put a footnote here because uh, Client Hints has been around for a number of years. Uh, some great work uh, that was done to bring it to fruition, but it also has flagged a number of security concerns around fingerprinting uh, because those Client Hints were also being sent to everybody. Um, so we've had some actually some really good uh, developments in the feature policy uh, spec and where we're evolving client hints now to be much more security aware. In fact, it's going to uh, hopefully bring us a spot where we can be a lot more security first conscious and actually help us uh, lock down the user agent because the user agent is such a terrible uh, HTTP header. Mm -hmm. So this way we are able enabling the developer to say these are the sites that I trust to do content to, uh, negotiation, where I want my images server or my video server to actually be able to do that negotiation for width and height uh, and DPR, uh, but I don't want I don't want those ad networks doing that, and I got control uh, to make that decision of what I trust, the, because the opportunity is not just about providing the right content, but also using other details about the environment that might uh, give a, a hint of. How do we get content to the eyeballs as fast as possible? So if you're using, say, uh, network RTT or just looking at congestion window, these are very low-level TCP uh, moments that uh, allow the server, perhaps, to recognize that, hey, you're in a uh, Wi-Fi, but you're in a hotel Wi-Fi. And it's not the greatest experience. It's really slow. So perhaps a server can then say, hey, I want to give you actually a a half DPR image. So the pixels are going to be half the volume of pixels. So I can send you across the wire uh, a much smaller file so I know it's going to get there and I'll let the browser do that upsizing for you. So that, you know, client hints can help you in that, uh, that regard, help that content negotiation back and forth. Images also play an important role in accessibility. And according to the HTTP archive and Lighthouse also, only about 50% of mobile images have alt attributes set. So this is a drum we've been beating for a very long time. And it's kind of surprising to hear that only half of images are properly set up for this. So why do you think this is still an issue? We started off by talking about, hey, there is this tension between content creators and us developers. The reality is that when I'm building something, the, the, first, the first user is me. And so it comes from my experiences that I start from. And the alt tag is a good example of accessibility. You know, you've got image, source, blah, 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 and then alt. The alt tag is used by anybody using a screen reader. And if you're using a screen reader uh, and you don't have that alt tag, you're going to have the, the person with has uh, visual difficulties. They're literally going to be listening to the URL of that string, right? Terrible. Now, the alt tag gives that person the opportunity to know that this is a, uh, you know, a dress with, with sunflowers on it, right? This is information that I, I care about when I'm looking at it. But the challenge is that I, as a developer, well, I'm fortunate enough to be 
to have good sighted uh, vision. So I don't suffer from this. So it's hard for me to remember to do to add the alt text of the description uh, attributes for the rest. Uh, and so unless you've got that direct tangible experience, it's easy to forget. So fortunately, we've got things like Lighthouse that have the accessibility scores in there that, to help remind us. Uh, but it's, it's a challenge. Um, now, there's actually some cool stuff. Uh, you know, the, there's a Canary version uh, of Chrome that's got, uh, that has machine learning uh, generating some of those alt tags. Uh, I think it's, we've, we're seeing some really cool stuff coming out uh, on that angle uh, to help with the accessibility. But even a machine learning based system that's going to generate tag, uh, you'll say that it's a dinosaur on a skateboard. It's, well, is that really what it is? It's still best to have that content uh, for you. It's yeah. a good safety net, but developers should still be providing that alt text if they can. Absolutely. And so when we talk about uh, images and video, there's actually a whole spectrum of that experience, right? So it's not just about the alt text, like why we're doing that all well, because we want to feel warm and fuzzy inside. Well, no, we're trying to do that for accessibility. It actually also helps with SEO and discoverability. So there's, there should be a lot of people championing for this. Uh, but there's, you also should be thinking about the, the experience as a whole because uh, we're dealing with eyes that are making decisions. Uh, you know, it's our lizard brain, if you will, right? Like we've got these cones and rods that go straight to our uh, visual cortex in the back of our head, and, and then it wakes up our mammal brain and says, hey, you want to pay attention. So we, we're creating visual content uh, experiences on the web to attract you, to get that hook, right? To, to, to get above the noise uh, of the web. But our eyes aren't all the same, right? Uh, some people have, uh, you know, colorblind, right? They have, we're taught in school that we've got three cones. Some people only have two cones or have two and the third cone's a little bit less, right? So that's where you get the gradients of red, green, uh, color confusion. Uh, but there's also a percentage of people, particularly it's, uh, women, that have four cones that can actually see more colors. Now the interesting bit about this is that all of our physiology invest, you know, research is all, you know, particularly around vision, is all based in the 1940s, you know, 50s, 60s. And it's predominantly dudes uh, that did all this research. And depending on who you're looking at, there's, there's different uh, people that will say, oh, maybe only 12% of women have this fourth chroma. Uh, some will say that there's you know, up to 50% of women. Um, so we have this other aspect here of visual experiences that are uh, different based on you know, some possibly gender, and there's just no research really to, to really say how much that really makes a difference. Um, but it does make a difference in when we make some of our decisions. So I said, you know, use 80%, uh, 80 uh, quality factor in JPEG. I take that back uh, because that's, that's almost a terrible choice. Uh, because if I'm saying quality 80, I'm assuming some editorial control. But I'm a, I'm a dude that has spent my time in front, of a, in front of code, and I've not spent my time uh, learning or listening to my lizard brain, learning how the creative expression works. And so I can very easily make a poor choice by saying quality 80 that will actually wash out those reds that a person who has better, uh, be better apparatus than I have would actually make difference, be able to see the difference between those reds and say, no, no, no that's not a good red. Uh, and uh, if you look at, this is actually, there's very few textile websites out there that offer feedback. There's a few out there that do. Uh, Lululemon is an example where if you look at the comments, the most common recurring comment uh, is that the, I love these, this clothing, but the color wasn't what I thought it was. Or, you know, and, and it's always about the color. It's not exactly what I expected it to be. And you know, there's this downstream impact, uh, you know, the returning products and things like that. But we expect that the image to be a representative of reality. But if we've got people making decisions and saying quality that water, uh, waters down those, uh, those colors, then that experience could be diminished. Um, so we, we have to be conscious of this. So the fortunate thing is that we also have uh, a lot of algorithms now that can help us define the right, the right combination of 
chroma subsampling or whether it be uh, quality to equality factors and, and decide you know, what's the, how do we preserve that experience using uh, structural similarity, SSIM-based uh, algorithms that try to make it more of an equation-based and more math-driven that look at the experience. Um, and you know, the, the emerging ones are also looking at the colors as, they, as a part of that input so that you can have confidence that I'm, yes, I want to reduce bytes, but I want to make sure that it meets the expectations of the content creator. Uh, so the accessibility is one aspect of it, but also the, the emotional experience. So we're trying to you know, grab that user and bring them in and, and you know, get that experience consistent. Mm. That's such a great example about the shopping cart thing because a user may look at a color in an image and not expect to see it come <laughs> arriving at their house a totally separate color. So the way that developers actually fine tune their image quality doesn't just save bytes on a wire and dollars and egress costs, but it actually could incur costs in return fees and Absolutely. bad reviews. And there's a real monetary cost to that. Absolutely. And I would love to be able to do some research on this. this is, you know, uh, one of these areas I think we haven't explored enough is like when we, you know, when the real world, so many times we, we walk down the street and we, uh, we walk by this fruit cart and all of a sudden we stop and we're like, oh yeah, actually I would like to have that apple. It's really, I like to make that choice. I like to buy that apple. And I was actually hungry. Yeah, I didn't know about it, but I was hungry. We're making these decisions because of the, uh, that lizard brain, right? Uh, seeing the environment. When we have the right combination of colors and experiences, uh, those decisions now alert our, so if I have the web without images, it'd be very fast. But we probably wouldn't see anybody actually engaging in your content because the hook isn't there. Um, and our content creation teams have spent their entire career learning how to get that hook, that emotional, that matches reality. I want to ask you about WebP. It's been around since 2010, but I'm ashamed to admit I haven't quite adapted it yet. So what do you think is the current advice you would give to somebody about WebP? Should I be using it? It's been around, what, since 2010 or so? Uh, it's a great format that has hit the web in the absence of other formats getting large traction. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different competing formats out there. But WebP uh, it, it, you know, is supported by Chrome and uh, predominantly. And more recently now, we've got Firefox and Edge that also support uh, Chrome. Uh, sorry, support uh, WebP. Now, WebP is try to learn from the past, you know, learn the techniques that we've developed over the last 20 years and be able to you know, apply new algorithms that can save more bytes. And, and so it's a really good mechanism. You know, I've got data that suggests that um, with JPEG, we've got techniques and with you know, say Moz JPEG, we can save another 10% of bytes. Uh, with WebP, depending on the size of the image, uh, we can save any, anywhere from uh, 10% up to 30% you know, uh, bytes. And it, it, it does depend, right? So small images, actually, we say you see that 30% byte savings. As you get to a larger image, it, it gets watered down, so it's about 10%. Um, but you, over what you could do with JPEG. So you, that's, that's some significant uh, byte savings across the wire. If you're, if you're constrained on that network, cellular network, then getting a visual hook in front of the person, that, that's a great win. But it comes with some cons as well, right? So JPEG's been around for a long time, as I said. It's a really fast decoder. So when we're dealing with uh, WebP, we have to deal with modern browsers. So we have to hope that everybody's adopting the latest browser like you and I might be. The reality is that not everybody does. I, you know, I still, see, uh, I still see a lot of Lotus Notes traffic. The people getting you know, web content in the browser and it's from Lotus Notes, or it's from an old version of Internet Explorer, or, or uh, fire, old versions of Firefox. Uh, there's a, the internet's weird. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, so the one part is, you know, is adoption. The second challenge is, of course, the use cases. With WebP, we have finally the ability to do transparency and even animation inside of a, a so we've learned those lessons from the JPEG days. But we are also constrained in two big ways. One is it's forcing chroma subsampling. That's what I was mentioning about the, uh, the technique that we've learned from the video industry of uh, the Luma and the chroma and be able to you know, reduce an amount of 
chroma, the eye, you're hacking the eye. Uh, you're, you're removing detail, but you're able to get, uh, get away with it. But what, uh, what WebP does is it forces a 420 uh, chroma subsampling, which means that there are many cases where it's not a good choice to use WebP. For instance, in uh, Asian markets, in most times you'll have uh, an image of whatever commerce that you're selling, and you'll have the lexicographical characters bonded to that image over top, maybe the red outline. And well, those hard lines uh, are very problematic for chroma subsampling. They become blurry, and y they're not great uh, when you have that blurry effect. So anytime you have hard lines or illustrations, uh, these are, are cases where WebP just falls down and doesn't support, isn't, uh, doesn't give us the flexibility that we need. And in the other uh, gap is uh, color palette, uh, color, color space. So in the web, we've built the web based on 1996 uh, standards around sRGB. You know, we, if we look at the amount of colors that the typical, I say typical, quote unquote, uh, three-coned uh, human uh, can experience. If we plot those uh, reddish, greenish, and bluish cones, we get this, uh, you know, you probably see it as a horseshoe shape, the X, Y, Z um, color space, you know, all possible colors. Now it's not two-dimensional, it's actually a three-dimensional goop, but you get the idea. sRGB was a standard established in the late 90s that said, we can represent these sets of colors and the triangle of colors, and we can represent that on the web and in LCD displays and so forth. So all of the web is based around this sRGB that it, it limits to eight bits per channel, so you get this 24-bit image of uh, color space that is really a fraction of the full colors that you can actually see. So with JPEG, there's some hacks you can do to kind of get over that. Uh, if you can you know, beg, borrow uh, the, the pixels uh, in the index, um, but you're st still limited. You know, you're, with WebP, you're, you're limited to this uh, sRGB. We, can't, we need to move beyond that uh, and to be able to support more colors because if we're trying to get that hook of that user, we need to represent reality. And sRGB is just a, a small percentage of that overall. Now, we've got devices if you've got a modern Android device or a modern uh, iPhone, you've got devices that can do P3. P3 is an even wider set of colors, uh, both in the uh, overall sets of color, but also the discrete colors between. Uh, and if you've got a 4K TV at home, you've got probably Rec 2020 uh, with high DPR, which is even larger. Uh, we're closing in on what we could do with analog film uh, back in the 70s, uh, of the colors that we can reproduce. Still not 100% of reality. So when we talk about formats, you know, these, these are some of the gaps. We've solved some, uh, and WebP is great and available in a lot of browsers, uh, but we have these other upcoming challenges uh, that we need to also solve. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> the internet is weird. <laughs> <laughs> I always say that, too. Yeah. So you had mentioned that WebP supports animations, and that brings me back to the days of like those blinking under construction GIFs that you'd see on the web everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so we've obviously come a long way, but what is the state of animations today, and what would you recommend for people who want to use them? Yeah, so animations, uh, you know, it's, it's one of the spots where it feels like it's been stagnant for a long time. Uh, but surprisingly, it's not died out. Everybody assumed like animate GIFs are terrible. Just to put it out there, like they're terrible because they're large. You know, for a, a very short clip of say a TV show, and if you have the, the sequence of that, that you know you can be racking up megabytes of data really quickly. But they're really good at expressing meaning and intent. That's why they're so popular in social media platforms because you're able to express an idea really quickly. And you've got the, it's, a, it's like a video, but it's muted, it loops. It's got a whole other, different creative aesthetic. Uh, so, but GIFs are really the only option out there. And we've done a lot of hacks to get you higher color palettes. It's not just 256, but able to get the, the effectiveness of a, a larger color palette, even though it's not uh, there. Uh, but we still have the, now this challenge of there's still really large images that with WebP, you know, like learning from the past, they obviously brought in the ability to support animation. Uh, say that 1.7 megabyte uh, animated GIF in a WebP is maybe about 300, uh, 300K. That's, that's pretty, uh, pretty awesome. Uh, but you also, 
uh, that only supports inside the Chrome environment. Uh, last year, uh, Apple and, and uh, WebKit uh, in the Safari 12 it brought in support for image source equals MP4. So you can actually ship an MP4 uh, to an image tag and get an animated GIF experience where you can have uh, a HEV-C or an H.264 payload inside that in MP4. It loads like an, MP, uh, like an image tag, but it's muted and it's looped. And that, so then you can take that. Uh, the advantage is there if you've got animations that are more uh, picture-based, because you know, have C in it and uh, H264, uh, those are really good codecs for for real life, you know, for uh, for video, mm -hmm. movies, TVs, that kind of stuff. So if you've got animations that have, uh, have that kind of content, then you've got a great vehicle that brings that 300k in WebP down to well, maybe 50k uh, in uh, have C. Uh, in the contrast, though, you still have these gaps of palette-based animations. If you're trying to illustrate the ionic bonds between, you know, for textbooks and things like that. In those cases, actually, GIFs might be still among the better, and WebP are good uh, for that. Uh, with, you know, with uh, these video codecs, they become a little bit more blurry. Uh, so maybe not as good. So there's still lots of room for us to figure out how to best uh, deal with these different composites. Um, just one little quick anecdote, though. It, it's not just those young kids with their animated GIFs. Uh, uh, talking with a number of even the ad tech industry, you know, they're trying to figure out how to get past people putting on ad blockers because, well, it's a crappy experience, uh, and in, up the game in the quality of the ads so that they're relevant and people aren't less like in. And uh, there's emerging research showing that yeah, animated GIFs are actually really good for conversions, but it can't be too noisy. Like too noisy really. You know, disturbs people, but uh, cinemagraphs—you know—the subtle movements create great engagement for the ad tech. In fact, it's working great in even commerce. You probably see those, like uh, the girl with the dress moving the dress, so you can see the color, the light refracting a little bit. So, uh, I think as we can start solving some of these, the technology bits, we're going to see the content creation kind of explode. Uh, looking for animations, we talk about animation as a as an image tag. Uh, the age-old, of course, uh, recommendation is, is to use video tags. You know, if you've got an animation, just convert it to MP4 and use a video tag. I mean, that's, that's probably actually the best uh, way to get, get the mix of all worlds. You don't have to depend on Safari just to get the image in the, uh, as an MP4 in, a, in an image tag. Uh, so if you can change your markup, you change your templates to use video, that's great. The challenge is that not everybody can modify the markup, right? Uh, if you've got a CMS system or if you've got some other you know, platform, uh, then you're going to have to, sometimes you have to live with the tools you have. So this is where these, you know, there's different strategies we can play. If you can play with the markup, then great. Use the video, you know, make, the, make it looping and muted. Uh, but if you are bound by the content, or it's going to be six months a year before you can you know, get the next code release out there that can do that conversion, then you, you still have lots of other tools uh, available to you. One more HTTP Archive stat that you've probably heard. About two-thirds of the average web page is made up of image bytes. So practically speaking, <laughs> if developers do optimize their images, what types of impact on the user experience could they expect to see, maybe web performance-wise? Yeah, so th this is a, one of those, those areas that uh, is a yes but no. Uh, you know, we see the stats and we say, you know, where am I going to get my byte savings to get uh, my user engagement up? And how am I going to get my light high, score, light high score up? And it's easy to say, pick on the, the big bully on the street. Uh, but it's, yes, there's a large amount of bytes on a web page that are dedicated to images and video and animations. But that's because we're trying to grip that user, engage that user, because people don't read, let's be honest. You want to see the content. But I think I mentioned this earlier, the, that images are a low priority resource in the browser, right? So when the browser is parsing the HTML, it's going to go and look for all of the CSS and JavaScript and, as it, in the, uh, the preloader. And, and if it finds images, it will make those requests in the network, but it'll put those as a low priority request uh, so that we get the CSS back and we can do the layout. So if you're going to save bytes on images, most times 
it's really the JavaScript that's still holding up the train. Unless you've got really tight CSS and JavaScript already, uh, saving bytes on images will, will not give you the same kind of bang, like you know, chopping 50% of your bytes is not gonna speed up your page 50%, uh, because you usually have a lot of this JavaScript. There are, there's a balance, counterbalance though. Uh, the counterbalance is that if you are, a lot of times you're, you're handcuffed to, to the system and solutions you have, saving bytes can actually help in some situations where you have a lot of uh, JavaScript that's inject, being injected and tag managers and things like that where the browser is actually getting confused and getting things out of order. Uh, I see lots of cases where the browser is, uh, the preloader, finds all of the images first before it finds the CSS and JavaScript, ships those requests, and then realizes that there's more JavaScript to be loaded and has to wait for those images to come across before it can do the other work. So in cases like that, where you've got the browser discoverability problem, uh, you actually, there, those are the cases where you can improve the base load. Uh, but there's another challenge, another metric that I think that we often need to look at, which is not just what the, the raw time to first byte or the time to uh, time to interact interactive or the the, the first uh, paint and things like that, but it's the how long does the user stick around? So if you know the best practices are around you know making sure that images are uh, small or, or you know byte wise and that we are. Uh, making sure our CSS and web fonts and things like that are discoverable and loaded first. Um, but we want to make sure that those images and video are loaded so when the user starts scrolling, that that content is there. Right? So the, the balance we want to find is uh, deferring image loading, and there's a lot of strategies to do that, right? Uh, from, I mentioned earlier, uh, low quality placeholders, we put a little SVG or inline text, to lazy loading, where we just use pure JavaScript and don't load that image until the user actually scrolls. Uh, those are good strategies to make sure the bytes aren't plugging up the, the pipe, but you also then want to counterbalance that with, once the layout has happened, once you've got all the JavaScript, you want to make sure that as the user goes to start scrolling, that they're there, you want to keep them there. Uh, you want to keep the user uh, going through their journey. So you want to then open up the gate and make sure that those images start to, to flow in after you've got all the essentials. So this is give and take that you need to uh, adjust, uh, but don't expect the world to move on those core metrics uh, for image and bytes uh, savings. It will, depends on your market, uh, but what you will see is by optimizing those bytes is your, your sessions, your user engagement as they uh, interact, those metrics should uh, start to improve as well. So what is the ideal solution of optimizing the bytes with the quality of images? Is it for people to spend more time understanding all of these different levers? on their configuration, or is it, you know, we need to rely more on computers and algorithms to do the right thing? <laughs> what you said, yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the, the challenge, right? We've got a lot of different formats, a lot of different levers to use, uh, and a lot of different contexts. And the good news is that we have a lot of developed uh, industry knowledge to run through that rubric uh, to evaluate the context of those images. So this is where we are really getting good as an industry, being able to classify, is this a, a picture or, with, or an illustration? Uh, is this got lots of high action movement or is it low action movement? Has this got uh, lots of colors or is this grayscale? Um, and from there, you know, what is the right experience that we're trying to drive? So, uh, you know, should we use this knob and this knob, should we change the quality low and quality high? Um, so yeah, absolutely we should be, depending on algorithms, because if we're marking, changing our markup, uh, there's a lot of different ways we can be expressing that. And there's almost a, a hamster in a wheel effect where there's always another technique that we can apply that I haven't thought about before. There's a lot of great tools out there uh, that allow us to, um, to just do that automatically. Um, and and uh, you can see that, I think Squoosh, uh, you know, there's a nice uh, tool there. You can, you can see how those, you know, apply the different check boxes and apply if I want to change it to Moz JPEG or whatever. Um, you can see the impact, but there's also great, uh, great tools that will do that for you, uh, that you can uh, apply, apply that in your build chain, apply that into your CMS, et cetera. 
not to mention you're not always in control over the images that get loaded on your site. Yeah. You don't, you're not always putting them on your CMS. Sometimes your own users are uploading them to your site. For example, my avatar or something. Like You <laughs> need those algorithms to process images outside of your control. Yeah, uh, and, and there's you know, you know there's a whole actually other dimension here of like uh, from a content reputation perspective, uh, from content you maybe don't want to have on your platforms uh, for legal or moral issues. Uh, but there's also uh, security concerns. Uh, you know, images and videos and things like that have had histories of other vulnerabilities, so where they become uh, a vehicle for passing on a, a CVE. Uh, where a certain decoder, if you're using image magic or something like that, could be exploited uh, with this certain kind of payload. So uh, this is yeah, absolutely where the algorithms come into play. Yeah, using depending on algorithms would be my number one recommendation for dealing with qualities and format selections. And then as we move into uh, the other doma domains like adjusting for colors and things like that. Uh, that's where you now need to focus your, you should be focusing your attention with your uh, creative teams. Yeah. Finally, would you recommend any resources for people to learn more about image optimization? Uh, there's a lot of great uh, resources. Uh, Addy has a great uh, site, images.guide. Uh, there's a lot of great uh, content there. Um, yeah, I've uh, published a number of different articles uh, around the role of client hints and some of the, the stats that uh, that we see there in the use of animations in uh, Safari. Um, and there's a bunch of, uh, in the web.dev uh, site, there's a ton of great uh, resources uh, about different strategies, different tools you can put in the build chain uh, to kind of you know, fill, that, uh, fill that flow. Well, Colin, this has been great. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. If you'd like to find links to everything we talked about, check out the description below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.